Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get going. So this is uh, the webinar today. We're talking about flow monitoring and its role in INI studies, a big topic for a lot of municipalities and, and others across you know, Canada, the world, but specifically Southern Ontario, we'll talk about mostly today. Um, so as with all of our webinars, uh, you know, a few things to keep in mind. Uh, typically consists of two parts. We'll do a bit of a presentation and then hopefully leave some time at the end to do some Q&A. Um, as we go along, you can type, there's a QA. and a you should see a little box. You can type uh, questions into the Q&A window or the chat and uh, we'll get to them uh, at the end of the Q&A session. Um, we do have a, a few polls. So we've, we put a couple polls back into this webinar. So keep an eye out. For the polls, you'll see them pop up and you can enter, enter your uh, your answers as we go through. I think we have three or four today, so keep an eye out for the polls. And if you are interested in um, uh, the POP credits, uh, we've been issuing certificates for all of the uh, attendees for our past webinars. So uh, again, if you are interested in getting a certificate of attendance, uh, feel free to reach out. There's our email there. And uh, we'll be happy to issue you, you a certificate of attendance at the end. Uh, usually it takes us a couple of days, but everybody, I believe, has gotten them for the last webinars. Uh, if you haven't, again, feel free to reach out. Um, bit of an agenda for today. So a uh, quick intro to us, Civica, and, and myself. Uh, I'll do a, a, a quick recap of what we talked about in parts one to three of the webinar. So this is a series a five part series. So this is part four. So if you missed the first three, hopefully um, you get a chance to go back and look at them. Hopefully it doesn't, you don't need too much information from those to follow along today, but there's some good information that are contained within those that I won't be chatting about today. Um, so hopefully you can check those out. Uh, they are on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, and then I'll go into sort of the, the meat for today, which is really talking about inflow and infiltration or INI. Um, we'll get into some of the analyses that can be performed and, and some of the things that we like to look at when we're trying to analyze flow data and, and make uh, recommendations and actions. I'll talk about some of the actions. So, um, you know, we, we all perform a lot of analysis. So what, what kind of actions come out of that? from those results and, and what are the next steps when you do um, get some of this information and what kind of activities you can do uh, to hopefully uh, fix some of the issues and, and further reduce or at least enhance your understanding of where INI is in the system and, and how to manage it. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, we'll do a Q&A at the, the end of the session. So a little bit about Civica and, and again, a lot of people have been on previous webinars, um, but if you don't know about us, uh, we are sort of INI specialists. Um, you know, we have a, a ton of uh, work, mostly in, in Southern Ontario, but throughout Ontario, um, doing INI studies. We're doing a lot of flow monitoring uh, across uh, the GTA and, and elsewhere, uh, down close to Windsor and, and all the way up to Ottawa and, and uh, as far north as I think Barry right now, so or Aurelia. Um, so we're doing a lot of work across across southern Ontario. Uh, we we do a lot of work in asset uh, services, so looking at assets, inspecting assets. A uh, few pictures here of our CCTV truck, our flush truck, um, doing condition assessments on the uh, uh, you know, various collection system assets. Uh, we do a lot of modeling as well uh, in terms of the various um, hydraulic, hydraulic and hydrologic modeling. Uh, we do that across, again, Southern Ontario. Master planning, water, wastewater, and stormwater master plans. We have uh, at least a 10, maybe a dozen of, uh, or so master plans going on right now. Um, basement and service flood studies. And then we also have a water resources group that works on a bunch of different water resources projects uh, as well. So just a little bit about Civica. Uh, myself, so I have uh, over eight years of experience of sort of flow monitoring, INI collection systems experience. Uh, my background is in hydrology and, and business. Um, I also have a, a you know experience both on the consulting and and the municipal side. Uh, so I worked for a municipality or for Region Appeal for over a year, 
um, part of the WIO collection systems committee and the magazine committee. Um, on the magazine committee side, I write the plant profile. So if anybody out there has any ideas, any cool facilities, pumping stations, treatment plants that uh, you think would be uh, cool to write an article about, please feel free to reach out on that. That's just a sort of side plug for my other job that I have with the, with the, the magazine committee. Um, so we'll, we'll launch our first poll. We haven't done this in a, a little while, so we'll we'll just get to learn a little bit about you. So um, what type of organization do you work for? Uh, it's always nice to get some feedback and hear from the audience as to what uh, where, where you're coming from. And we'll just give uh, maybe 30 seconds for everybody to shoot in an answer. Yeah, a couple more seconds. We have almost all participating. So we have about three quarters of the audience are from municipalities, a couple um, folks from provincial government or agencies, uh, a couple folks from the engineering consulting world or contracting world, uh, somebody from conservation authority, one from a land development firm. So good mix. Uh, you know, usually we have a big municipal uh, attendee. So welcome to everybody. Glad everybody could come. Um, so let's move on. Okay, so this is where we're at. So we've done, this is part four of our, our five part series. Um, you know, we're looking to schedule part five shortly. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I think it's been a pretty good success so far. Uh, we've had a, a lot of good attendance and, uh, you know, some some key experts speaking about the various topics. So hopefully keep that going today. Uh, talking about I and I. Next one, we'll be talking about uh, sort of more on the modeling side. How do we use flow data, and and what kind of things we're looking for when we're we're ultimately getting to that step where we're we're doing some modeling. So this is where we are, and uh, yeah, part five will be sometime in June, I believe. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so yeah, quick recap from from part one. So this is the uh, the original we did one we did um, back. I think it was uh, in December. Um, so the intro to collection system flow and rainfall monitoring, we kind of did the five W's and one H of, of what it is, um, really focused, you know, why do we do this, you know, we want to understand what's happening, sort of from a natural impact, what, what kind of rainfall and, and natural variability are we seeing um, in, in terms of how we have to respond to those things, um, get a good, get a greater understanding of, of what kind of systems, what kind of um, events are happening in our various locations that we are, um, assess our infrastructure and how they perform when those events do happen. So uh, are they performing as designed? And then planning. So how do we make the systems better? Uh, you know, we have to accommodate growth. We have to accommodate changes in climate. So uh, a lot of the, the projects and a lot of the tools that we use are really to understand how do we make and optimize these systems and then plan for the future 10, 15, 30 years out to make sure that we are, um, you know, understanding the, the limitations of the infrastructure, but also how do we best accommodate these things that are going to happen in the future. Um, so that was part one. Part two, we, we talked about some of the technologies. So uh, we talked about rain gauges and flow monitors and the type of equipment available. And we had two experts come in. So we had Scott Brown from Hoskin and Dave Walker from Detectronic. And they talked about, again, some of the equipment that's available. There's a wider range of equipment that's out there, but it was good to get sort of two industry experts in to talk about some of the equipment that's available, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages and things like that um, from the, the different equipment that can be used for these types of studies. And then last time, we, you know, we really focused on data quality. How do we capture and collect good data? Um, as I go into today, we talk more about analyzing data. Um, it's all good. You, know, to, you can perform the best you know, world-class analysis uh, as much as you want, but if the data coming in is, is not good, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So really the last... Um, webinar was focused again on data quality. What are the activities you can do in the field uh, to select sites and, and operate and maintain and calibrate this equipment, um, both from a sort of flow monitor and rain gauge standpoint. 
Uh, and then the sort of remote activities, what, what kind of things are we looking at from the office side to make sure we're, we're collecting and, and again, getting that good data. So alarming, scoring, doing quality assurance, quality control. Um, Alex, who was in, in the last webinar, was, went through a lot of uh, examples using scatter graphs and other tools that we have to make sure, again, that at the end of the day, we're collecting the best data we can. And at least there's some transparency at the uh, at the end of the day, there may be sites that just can't collect good data, but as a utility, as a municipality, you want to at least have a line of sight as to what data is good, what data is bad, and which ones you should be using to make decisions and, and perform analyses with. And I think that's kind of the ultimate goal for a lot of the things we do is at the end of the day, it's, you know, don't use this site. It has poor quality data. Let's fix it. Let's move it to a different location so we can get good quality data. And then that will filter into all the analysis that we're going to talk about today. So that's a, a bit of a recap into the last three um, webinars that we did. And again, if you uh, do want to go check them out, check out our website. Uh, all the videos are on there. Um, so today, today we're going to talk about inflow and infiltration. So I'll just do a, a quick intro. And I imagine most people are pretty familiar with with I and I, but. Uh, always good to kind of get a refresher so you know in, in the, the work that we do and i and i is specifically a wastewater or sanitary sewer system uh issue we'll say um you know in most cases in, in pretty much every municipality our sewers are designed our, our wastewater sanitary sewers are designed to collect wastewater obviously um and this originates from sort of domestic commercial industrial activities um, and typically there is some design allowance for INI. So this is, you know, a graphic on the top right that we typically see is, you know, from an ideal design perspective, there's a certain amount of sewage or wastewater that is allowed, and then as well as some allowance for, for INI. And what we see in actuality in a lot of cases is this situation on the right is where the actual INI is much higher than the design. Um, so this may not this may be an issue, may not be an issue. Um, I know some municipalities that like a little bit of I and I in their system. It kind of flushes it out, does some natural flushing of the system. Um, and in this particular case, you know, it doesn't exceed the pipe capacity, so maybe that's not quite an issue. But what we do see a lot is uh, when the pipe, when there's excessive I and I, and there's too much, and the pipe uh, pipes become uh, or, or over capacity, then we'll get things like backup and flooding into basements. Um, so this is really, you know, all this extraneous flow that we call getting into wastewater systems from rain, uh, rain on snow, snow melt and groundwater. So a little bit is OK, and, and it just depends on how much is getting into the system and where it's getting in. And you may have you know, further issues. Um, so some of the drivers that, you know, I've already talked about basement flooding is one of the reasons why we want to measure and reduce INI. and i um, you know, municipalities have experienced a lot of basement flooding uh, in the last 10, 20, 50 years. So um, something that is driven by, in a lot of cases, rainfall or snow melt or rain on snow events, um, getting into the sanitary sewer systems, backing those systems up into people's homes. So uh, one of the big drivers that we've seen across at least Southern Ontario is to try and reduce uh, that basement flooding. Um, you know, when we have things like uh, combined sewer overflows, sanitary sewer overflows and bypassing at treatment plants, you know, there's an environmental protection side of this that we want to try and reduce these events as much as possible. Again, so trying to get that uh, stormwater out of the wastewater system so that we can prevent these things from happening. Uh, regu regulatory compliance, so uh, various uh, you know, ministry documents, the new CLIECA regulations, um, things like that that we're trying to get our INI to an acceptable level to be more compliant with those regulations. Um, another kind of big driver for us is to try to reduce costly infrastructure upgrades as much as possible. So if there is a ton of I and I in a system and we're constantly upsizing pipes or building bigger pumping stations and treatment plants, um, those are typically very uh, large capital projects that um, may be able to be deferred or not not designed to such a level if we can reduce a manageable amount of I and I into the system. And then for growth needs, so if there is a new development that's coming in line and trying to tie into existing infrastructure, but a lot of that capacity is taken up by INI or what other flow, 
um, then there's a big drive there to try and reduce those flows to accommodate the, the growth that we are seeing across across Ontario. Uh, so these are the three sort of I and I programs that we work on at Civica. So typically we kind of work on them in order, if possible. Um, new subdivision I and I is, is relative, uh, you know, relatively new program across Ontario. So trying to again prevent I and I at its inception when when these new subdivisions or uh, developments are happening. How do we try and reduce I and I? Uh, or prevent I and I, I should say, from getting into the system at that point in time. I and I reduction. So usually this is your typical uh, existing uh, um, infrastructure that's 10, 20, 50, 100 years old. Um, so we're trying to identify these areas where there's lots of I and I getting into the system, reduce I and I. Uh, and then finally, there's sort of the I and I acceptance and mitigation, and that'll probably be more of a, a focus for our next webinar around, okay, we've done all our cost effective reductions. Uh, how do we come up with solutions to accommodate the flow? Um, is it things like upsizing, storage, um, bigger pumping stations, things like that, that we need to say, eventually you have to say, okay, we've done all these cost effective reductions. What's left? What do we have to accommodate for? Um, so that again, most of today will be focused on sort of the middle part on I and I reduction and sort of the flow monitoring analysis you can do to assess I and I and, and focus where to do those reductions. And then next webinar will be more on the sort of acceptance and mitigation side. Um, so here's the audience poll number two. So how much uh, impact does I and I have on your system and your planning? Um, and I, you know, most people, I guess, are working for municipalities, so this may be um, very relevant to you if you're not working for a municipality, maybe it's the projects you're working on, are you taking I&I &I into consideration for a lot of the work that you're doing. Let's give it a couple seconds here. Okay. So, we have most most participation over eighty five percent participated. Um, so, if I add these up, I'm a, I'm about uh, fifty. I'd say eighty five percent of the votes say that there's either a moderate or significant impact. It's about 50% that's saying it's a significant impact and with 37 to 40, around 40% saying a moderate impact. So majority of, of those that voted are saying that it does have a significant impact on the system and the planning. Um, there's a couple of people that say there's a minimal impact and, and good for you. Hopefully you can share the your, your success stories with the rest of us um, and a few people that aren't sure. So it does seem like there is quite a, uh, an impact, and, and that's what we see across you know, a lot of southern Ontario, is that there is an impact, quite a significant impact in a lot of cases in terms of how to manage and, and plan for future growth or um, you know, trying to reduce flooding or, or, or bypassing, things like that. And so that's a, a very common, I think if you expanded that poll across southern Ontario, you get very similar results. Okay, so let's jump into some of the analysis that that we do. Um, how do we utilize flow monitoring and rainfall monitoring to assess the systems, you know, specifically from an I and I perspective? So the first thing you need to do is is analyze rainfall, um, because you need to then see what what happened, what sort of natural occurrence rainfall happened, and then you can characterize, you know, what goes on in the, the infrastructure. So the first thing that we typically do, I mean, you know, other than obviously measuring the rainfall, uh, you know, when we talk about volume and duration and things like that, is we want to uh, sort of characterize that and put it in context with some of the other storms that we're collecting. So this is a, a sample IDF um, chart that we create for all of our projects, essentially that we're doing flow and rainfall monitoring for. So this is, it would be a typical IDF uh, intention 
intensity duration frequency curve. And so this kind of describes the relationship between rainfall intensity and rainfall duration and the return period. So when people are talking about a two year storm or a hundred year storm, this is uh, the type of analysis that's happening. Um, so on this graph, we have these gray lines, which are your sort of design storms or your, your return period storms. Uh, typically, you can find these. Environment Canada has a big repository online for uh, ton of municipalities across Canada. Um, so we would typically pull those, and these are based. These are essentially return and, and um, return period or IDF curves that have been generated. I think they have to have at least thirty years of data to to generate a you know, accurate one, anyways. Um, so we'll plot those for for a particular location, and then all of the rainfall events that we capture during a particular study area will be plotted on here to, again, characterize how intense, how um, frequent we, could we expect a storm of that size to, to um, hit that particular location. So this is analyzed at for each site, for each sort of rain gauge, let's say, where we have um, data collection, where we're, we're actually collecting rainfall data. Um, so this will put into context, again, how big these storms are and, and you know, how do we assess that against some of our design criteria, let's say, if we're trying to design to a certain type of storm for the infrastructure. Uh, when we scale that up, um, because most of the projects that we're working on, um, you know, for municipalities, for example, uh, they typically have more than one rain gauge. Uh, they have a, a fairly large, in some instances, have a fairly large um, geographic area that they're covering with their rain gauge networks. So uh, we typically like to create plots similar to this one. This is for Niagara region. They have 20 rain gauges uh, and all the data is open online. Um, and so we like to do that type of analysis in IDF analysis, for example, and then present it in a format where you can see across the, the um, region, what happened uh, at a particular site. And this is, you know, credit to York region. I think they've been doing this for quite a long time. I think they call it the candlestick map, essentially trying to uh, understand how much rainfall hit in a particular uh, location and to characterize the return period. So some of these rain gauges had over 60 millimeters of rain and some up here had, you know, less than five millimeters of rain. Uh, and so these were all, most of it was less than two year storms. Some of the rain gauges, it was a five to 10 year location or, or uh, return period for that location. So, you know, it gives you some context in terms of where the system hit, where the most rain was received, what how big that storm was. Um, you know, if you're, if you saw a large response, a large flow response in your stormwater or wastewater systems in some of these areas, you know, maybe that's expected. And if you didn't see anything here, you know, again, you didn't get a lot of rainfall. But if you do see a big response in this area and not a large response in this area, you know, you can't just say, oh, the systems are worse in, in Welland or down here in, in Fort Erie because, um, you know, not the same rainfall event hit equally across that, that area. So it's a good sort of visual representation, again, depending on how big uh, a ge geography and how big your study is that that you're trying to look at, but um, trying to context put in context where these storms are hitting, how much, what's the return period, um, is a good good idea to to because rainfall rarely hits equally across a large geographic area. Um, another you know analysis and tool that we use is uh, distributed rainfall modeling or um, some sort of interpolation to understand what happens between rain gauges. So uh, some of the study areas, you may have a rain gauge in it, maybe you don't, um, maybe you can leverage nearby rain gauges. Um, so if you're doing uh, a flow monitoring project right near this rain gauge, for example, then you're probably fine um, to use this rain gauge. But if you're doing it somewhere out here where you don't have a rain gauge or in between rain gauges, um, you can leverage and, and produce this type of sort of thematic map to show, uh, again, using an assumption of, of inverse distant weighting or some sort of interpolation method as to what happened at a location where you maybe didn't have a, a rain gauge right in that steady area. Um, so this is one of those kind of tools and techniques that are used 
to understand what happens again at a place where you may not have the rain gauge right on site. It's hard to, uh, across a, a larger geography or a large municipality, to have a, a, a rain gauge you know, on every block. It's just not feasible. So tools and techniques like this are good to understand what happens in those locations between where you have rain gauges. Uh, you know, as you scale up, as you get more sort of sophisticated, um, you know, there's techniques that leverage radar. So uh, a lot of municipalities are moving towards gauge adjusted radar rainfall. So you can leverage radar data, um, historical radar data to kind of calibrate what happened at a location where you did have a rain gauge and then use that same information to understand you know, you can calibrate essentially the radar and then overlay that on areas where you don't have a rain gauge to understand how much rainfall fell at those locations. So it's a, it's more sophisticated, more accurate in terms of how much rainfall fell on a catchment, let's say, that you're monitoring where you don't have a rain gauge physically inside it, or if you're looking at a large catchment or a large geography that uh, you can leverage some of that radar data to further enhance your understanding of what happened uh, at a particular site where you're monitoring flows, let's say. Um, some of the future direction is, is going to climate forecasting. So again, the previous uh, um, slides and, and analyses are more around what happened in the past, um, you know, from IDF analysis to interpolation to radar. It's again, trying to understand, okay, what happened in the system? How much rain did we get? And then translating that impact onto your flow monitoring and your wastewater collection systems. A lot of the future work is going towards, you know, forecasting. So there's various climate forecasts available, open source, um, various, you know, radars, King City is one near kind of Toronto GTA, um, utilizing Buffalo for, you know, Niagara area up to Hamilton. Um, so this is trying to, again, forecast what's going to happen in, in the future in the next two, four, you know, eight hours, 24 hours. Um, and this will probably be a, a topic for a future webinar is to how do we understand that information going from sort of descriptive um, analytics of what happened in the system after the sort of aftermath of report of what happened, you know, in a big storm, we want to see what the impact was in our systems and trying to move more towards a predictive uh, what's going to happen um, in two hours from now. So keep an eye out. We'll probably do a webinar in the next uh, hopefully six months or so, 12 months to, to kind of show you where that that uh, sort of analysis is going. But that's kind of the direction that a lot of things are going in terms of using forecasts for uh, real-time control um, and understanding what's, how that's going to impact the infrastructure in, in these various areas. Okay, so, you know, we need the input, we need the rainfall. Um, you know, some people may agree or disagree, maybe we don't need rainfall, maybe it'd be nice to live in a, a bit of a drier location, but that's the world we live in. We get a lot of rain, um, we do get big storms, we get a lot of big convective storms in the summer, so it does impact our systems, obviously, as we saw in the last poll, um, it has an impact in, in terms of uh, what what it does and, and, and how it affects our, our collection systems. So uh, we'll move into flow, flow analysis and some of the things that we take into consideration and that we're doing in terms of analyzing flows and what that all means for, for you know, I&I and, I and how we address some of those issues. Um, so the first one is actually dry weather flow, uh, which doesn't really have anything to do with I&I and I per se, but it is a key input as well. Um, because we need to understand the dry weather flow pattern um, so we can separate that flow from the wet weather flow when rain events do occur. So this is your sort of typical dry weather flow pattern, sort of, you know, this is a full day, midnight to midnight. Uh, you have your low flows, kind of 3, 4 a.m., uh, peak flows, uh, your week day, which is in blue, is, you know, somewhere around 7, 8, 9 a.m., a little bit later on the weekends, um, you know, less water usage throughout the day, and then another kind of peak uh, dinner time after dinner, getting ready for bed, that kind of thing. So this is your sort of typical dry weather flow pattern. Um, it does vary depending on the size of the catchment and the land use, but this is sort of 
you know, ideal situation, what you get when you're, you're measuring flows uh, during dry weather. This is just, you know, normal wastewater usage. Um, the good, the, the one component that is good to understand here is your groundwater infiltration rates. So typically sort of industry standard is to assume that uh, groundwater infiltration or GWI is some percentage of your minimum nighttime flows. So usually, again, your, your minimums are around 3, 4 a.m. And some estimation between 50 and 80% of that is groundwater infiltration. It depends on, again, land use and, and sort of knowledge of your catchments. But that's sort of around, uh, you know, somewhere in that range of 50, 80% is typically assumed to be groundwater infiltration. So when we talk about inflow, but really the second part of that infiltration, um, you know, it's good to understand how much groundwater is getting into the system. Uh, we typically do this type of analysis over different periods over the year. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit um, so that we can understand, you know, groundwater infiltration in the spring when you have thaw and rain on snow and, and things like that. Typically you'll see higher groundwater infiltration rates. And so we like to run this analysis over multiple times per year so we can see, you know, where is it, how high is the infiltration, is it higher than some of the sort of uh, industry benchmarks and KPIs that we're looking at, and does that trigger some action from in terms of reducing those infiltration rates. Um, and the second part and sort of the, the key is is at least for a lot of municipalities, I mean, infiltration is certainly uh, an issue in a lot of locations, um, but we typically tend to see, um, you know, overflows, basement flooding, things like that um, during rain events, during high peak inflow events. And so this is our sort of typical INI uh, separation analysis that we do. Um, this is, again, a key to why we run that dry weather flow analysis so we can put that into the system. Um, so what we're, we're analyzing here is, you know, a rainfall event. Here's our time series. So this is our um, sort of predicted dry weather flow pattern in green. Um, so you can see before any rain event, the blue and the green line. So the blue is measured flow and our sort of predicted dry weather flow are right on top of each other. And then as the rainfall hits, we see our measured flow go up. Um, this would be our sort of expected dry weather flow or predicted dry weather flow during that same time period. Um, and then if you subtract essentially the blue line from the green line or the green line from the blue line, you get the, the INI flow. So how much INI above and beyond what you would predict, you know, if that rainfall event didn't happen, how much flow are you getting above and beyond that dry weather flow pattern? And that's your, your sort of your INI um, uh, input to the system or your rainfall getting into the wastewater system. Um, so this is a flow separation analysis, flow separation tool. Um, and then we can generate various KPIs. Um, probably most popular would be an INI rate. So your liters per second per hectare, um, your sort of normalized uh, per unit area uh, INI, um, but also INI volumes, how much flow, how much rainfall got into the system. Um, that's a, a, you know, um, again, the volume, the, the CV percentage or your volumetric coefficient is essentially, again, sort of a percentage of how much of that rainfall volume got into the system. Uh, peaking factors, so how, how fast and how high did that um, inflow get at the sort of usually around the peak of the storm event. And we can use these KPIs to understand what we want to target in terms of whether and, and understand if it's an inflow versus an infiltration issue and the sort of actions we want to take depending on what, what the perceived issue is or what the data is telling you, us that the issue is. Um, um, so, you know, this is, this is a, a, again, at a site, an analysis that happens at a site, and this is one rain event. When we want to understand what's going to happen over time or during different storm events, we would measure a number of different events, you know, the more the better typically. 
uh, to understand what's going to happen uh, in a design storm event or during some of these larger events, what the response in the, the sewer system is going to be. Um, so this is a, a site that we have data for over 30 storms for. Um, so this is a relationship between the rainfall intensity for that given storm and the peak I and I rate for that storm. So this can be done, you know, sort of this is a what would be called a Q versus I plot. So um, intensity versus uh, I and I rate. So this would be um, something that you could do for all your storm events. We also do um, sort of rainfall volume versus flow volume. So that's another similar type of analysis that can be done. And then going back to our IDF curves, we, we know uh, essentially what a two-year storm peak intensity is. So we can project this out to understand uh, what happens in a to this particular site in a 25-year storm or a 100-year storm. Um, you know, as with all analyses, it's, it's based on the quality of the data. And, you know, in the nature of what we are monitoring, we're typically doing one, two, I think this is a three-year um, study. So you're not essentially expecting to always capture a 25-year storm or a 100-year storm in a three-year period. Um, so as you you'll see most of the data is concentrated down towards the, the lower end because you do get uh, smaller storms more frequently. You do see some of these storms, you know, some of the larger storms, but as you project out, your margin of error does get a bit a bit bigger. But this is, gives you, again, a good understanding of what's going to happen, what we've recorded to date, and then what's going to happen if we do receive a 10-year storm or a 25-year storm. Um, you know, ideally, the the this is a R squared of 0.7, so the relationship between intensity and I and I rate in this particular situation is is pretty good. Um, you know, typically with a Q versus I or an intensity versus rate graph, you do see uh, a lot of variability. There's a lot of factors that can uh, affect um, this relationship, not just because of uh, an intense event, but seasonality. Um, antecedent moisture, all that kind of stuff impacts, you know, it's not just the rainfall intensity that that uh, sort of dictates this relationship. But anyways, this is a good place to start. And a lot of the, the analysis that's required and, and um, uh, that we do for, for many projects requires or, or involves this type of analysis. Again, that's at a site, uh, you know, so you can understand what happens at a site uh, what we think is going to happen in a 25-year storm at a particular site, scaling this up again to a, a larger um, uh, context is, you know, okay, let's understand, let's do these type of uh, I and I analyses, these type of projections across a larger area, and then we can map them. So this is something that we we do uh, quite often. Uh, again, because we don't get the same rain event that hits every area equally, this is a good tool to use to project for all of your different sites. It's a it's a unique relationship of rainfall intensity versus INA rate, let's say. Um, but as you develop that relationship and you, you get that regression, you can then compare two sites that aren't, you know, that didn't receive the same rainfall events all the time because that re relationship is reflective of what was happening at that site. So you can compare without that type of analysis, you can't really compare catchments apple to apple. You need some sort of projection or regression to do that. Um, you know, there are other ways to do it, but that that's certainly one of the most effective and sort of um, cost effective ways to do it. So this is again scaling this up. Per, doing this type of projection for 10, 20, 30 different areas where you have flow meters and then projecting that onto a thematic map or something like that, whatever, you know, you can put this into a table or a map or both and present the results that way. So just another way of scaling it and being able to, to understand what's happening in different catchments in different geographies. And this really helps to prioritize again, um, you know, where are you going to focus your efforts? You can't be typically everywhere at once. So where are the red areas? Where are the problem areas? Let's focus our efforts there. Um, and then, and then, you know, you can kind of work your way down the list as you see fit. Another uh, good sort of application of, of this type of analysis is, um, 
again, evaluating larger storms. Um, maybe there's, and we've seen a lot of um, requests in RFPs and things like that of trying to evaluate what's going to happen in uh, 30 years due to climate change. Are we going to get you know bigger storms, more intense storms? Um, so this may be you know our 25 year storm in 2023. Maybe this is our 50 year storm in 2023. But you know if we want to understand, okay, there's a 20% increase in peak intensity, rainfall intensity that we expect in in the next 20 30 years. What do we think is going to happen? Again, it's it's as the relationship gets further out, there's more sort of error and variability around that, but at least we can come up with a range to say, if the storms get 20%, 30% larger, this is what we would expect to happen in that particular case. Um, so there are, you know, a, a ton of limitations to, to the analysis um, of doing wet weather flow analysis. Uh, I already talked a little bit about rain gauge placement, how many rain gauges you have. Um, if your rain gauge is 50 kilometers away, even 10 kilometers away, in a lot of cases, um, it's going to be hard to understand the impact of rainfall on the flow. Um, you know, I, everybody's been in a situation where you're on the phone with somebody and they're maybe two blocks or, you know, halfway across a, a city. And it's like, oh, it's pouring here and it's sunny in one another location. So, Getting that good rainfall data, if you can leverage um, radar and, and products like that, then definitely will help to understand, again, the impact on the system. Um, the duration of the monitoring program, uh, as I showed in that projection, we had over 30 storms that we were able to develop that relationship with. Um, you know, a lot of municipalities are you know, struggle to do a permanent monitoring program. Uh, again, most mostly from a cost perspective, um, but but even just from a priority pers perspective, it needs to be the longer the data set is, the more confidence we have in the results and in the the um, correlation of those those variables. Um, so duration of the program, how long we've been collecting data for seasonality. So if you're collecting um, you know, data in a particularly wet year or wet time of year, if you're doing just spring flow monitoring, um, maybe you have elevated groundwater uh, infiltration levels or vice versa if you're doing it in summer, fall when the um, groundwater levels are lower, you may think you have uh, less of a problem than maybe you do if you were to monitor during the spring. So the, the seasonality, you know, how long you're going to do it for it, uh, you know, typically we like to recommend having at least some of your key areas in your infrastructure that are monitored basically permanently. Um, but there can be, you know, limitations to that. But again, just understanding that the limitation of only doing a one month or a three month monitoring program, you may get different results if you than if you kept it in for a longer period of time. Um, small areas, so small catchments versus large catchments. Um, you know, there could be a whole probably paper on on just that aspect of itself, but uh, smaller is typically a bit better. The larger you get in terms of your catchment areas, uh, you, you know, you're going to sort of average the results of a, a very large area into one flow monitor. So you may get, uh, uh, you know, an area that has 0.3 liters per second per hectare in a thousand hectare area, but there may be a pocket there that has you know, massive inflow and infiltration and, and has flooding or has potential for flooding. And it's kind of muted by the rest of the flows. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, sort of analysis and thought that goes into selecting and breaking out areas to make sure that you're, you're monitoring uh, sort of the right scale and the right size. Um, one I have called bracket areas. So that's essentially, trying to monitor in series. So when you have a monitor downstream and a monitor upstream, and you're trying to understand what's happening in the place, in the, in the catchment in between, so you're subtracting flows. There's a lot of challenges when it comes to subtracting flows and the best way to go about that. Again, the whole kind of paper and topic could be done just on, on subtracting flows and, and making sure you're using the right data to 
to calculate the wet weather flow for a given area. If you do have, you know, a trunk sewer with 10 flow meters along it and you're trying to subtract flows um, all the way down, it, it gets kind of tricky in terms of assessing that that intermediate area or bracket area for I and I. So something that needs to be taken into consideration. There's you know certainly ways around it, but just one of the limitations that uh, that you have with with flow monitoring and I and I analysis. And then you know I'll go back to the data quality thing. You know, if you didn't see our last webinar, feel free to check it out. But the the quality of the data is paramount if you're going to do this type of analysis, again, garbage in, garbage out. So always looking again at the end of the day, do we have the right data? Is the quality of the data good so that we can then do these analyses and have confidence in the, the, the results and the recommendations we're making from those results? Uh, so one of, the, one of the last polls we'll have is, uh, are you currently involved or planning any INI studies? So should have a pop-up pop up there. Okay, so it looks like... Um, about 60% or so are saying they do, 30% um, no, and around 10% saying maybe. So still on the fence, we're trying to figure out what maybe the full scope of that would be. Okay. Um, okay, so we do rainfall analysis, we do flow monitoring analysis. I mean, there's a lot more behind the scenes, obviously, than we can talk about today. Um, but now we want to create actions. We want to understand the data. Um, you know, this is a good sort of graphic. Uh, measure the rain, understand the impacts, to, you know, determine or, or sort of analyze the response, to determine where those impacts hit, assess those impacts. Was there flooding? Was there backups? Was there overflows? What was, what was the ultimate sort of result of that uh, that rainfall event or snow, snow melt event and, and what actions can we, we create from, from those results. Um, so the first one is sort of what I'll call inflow and rapid infiltration. Um, so these are sort of these quick responses sort of during, shortly after and during rain events. Um, so in the this particular graph that we've, we one of the projects we were working on, Basically, what you can see is as soon as the rainfall starts hitting, uh, you, you get these elevated flows. The highest flow, you know, right at the end of the rainfall event, just accumulation of effects, rapid response, you know, within less than half an hour of the, the peak rainfall, you get your peak flows. And then once the rainfall finishes, uh, you know, you get back down to your to your sort of normals dry weather flow pattern pretty quick. So this is typical in a lot of areas. This is a, a rapid inflow or rapid infiltration. Um, typically when we have inflow, we have things like catch basins and downspouts and um, sump pumps and, and various direct roof, you know, commercial roof drains, things like that, that are directly connected to the sanitary system that are, as soon as it starts raining, starts pouring into that system. Um, so some of the tools and techniques, again, flow monitoring, trying to, if you see this at a, this type of response in this graph at a, a large catchment area, a thousand hectares or whatever that may be, um, trying to pinpoint that down to understand at a smaller scale, scale where most of this flow is coming from. So flow monitoring, again, if you see this at a, a, a large catchment basin, okay, let's install a few upstream to kind of pinpoint where that's coming from. Uh, you may start, if you're in a smaller catchment, you may start doing your investigation work, uh, lot inspection, smoke testing, dye testing. Uh, we'd like to do wet weather CCTV and that wet weather uh, maintenance hole inspections. So that would be, again, more of that rapid infiltration part where there's uh, trenches getting full of water and gushing into the sewers via, you know, uh, gaps or holes in the pipes or in the manholes. Um, so those are the types of techniques and, and uh, tools and, and investigation activities that we like to do 
uh, during or shortly after uh, uh, rain events and then smoke testing and things like that will you can do, I mean, ideally you're doing that during dry weather so that you can identify where all those cross connections are. And really the goal for these tools and sort of techniques and investigations is to find and disconnect those inflow sources, disconnect your catch basins, downspouts, whatever you have that may be contributing water to the sanitary sewer system. Um, you know, we talked about wet weather, sort of acid inspections, CCTV, maintenance hole inspections. Here's just a few pictures of, of some of the locations we've been to during uh, some of these more significant storm events where we have, you know, during dry weather, a maintenance hole beside the creek and then one where it's under a couple feet of water. Um, another case, you know, dry weather where this maintenance hole is has a little bit of water interacting with the chimney. And then as we get there and we do our inspections during wet weather, a lot more interaction. And this is your sort of end result is uh, a ton of water coming into the system. This is the, the second example, uh, just water gushing into to the sanitary, um, you know, massive amount of water causing issues, uh, potential backups if this is one of many areas where the water is getting in. Obviously, this can really impact the capacity of the, the sewer system. Uh, for infiltration, uh, so this is sort of the second one. Uh, this is sort of like your prolonged flow response after your sort of rain or melt events. So we like to look at things like flow volume at various uh, times of the year. Uh, so this particular site had a, a much higher flow volume uh, in March. Uh, probably, you know, two or three times the amount in December and January. And then once things dried out a little bit in April, we see these, these elevated flow go back down. So we can tell this is a seasonal thing. There's not a ton of rainfall happening at this time of year, but we still see those elevated um, flows. So we know there's a lot of, uh, you know, thaw and melt happening. So that's when we see uh, typically in a lot of locations where this infiltration may be an issue if you see highly elevated flows during these times of year. Um, this is just another sort of way of representing it. So this is our, you know, early February, um, mid-February sort of normal base flow, not super high. As we start to get storm events, we get these rain on snow and thawing out. That's when we start to see this elevated base flow. So when we run that dry weather flow tool, like I showed at the start, your groundwater infiltration rate went from, I think it was like two liters a second up to 10, 12 liters per second. Um, so this is the type of thing that we're looking at when we want to understand uh, how much infiltration is getting into the system uh, for a particular site. And again, so this is the slow sort of prolonged response uh, after rain and, and sort of melt events and thawing during the spring. Uh, so again, flow monitoring, a good technique if you want to narrow that down into where you think potentially it's coming from or you want to understand further where it's coming from in the system. Um, again, CCTV inspections, uh, maintenance hole inspections, trying to do this uh, both during dry and wet weather. I think dry is good in this particular case. You can find where there may be defects, you know, um, gaps in the pipe, holes in the pipe, where these things may be coming in, where this water is getting into the system. Uh, so you can look at your sort of regular grouting, uh, mainline rehab. Uh, maintenance hole rehab type of activities. Wet weather inspection is still good because a lot of these um, defects, these joints may be just sort of trickling or gushing in water for months at a time. So going in, doing those inspections um, shortly or during after wet weather events, you'll see, you'll, you tend to see that, that type of defect quite often. And really the goal, again, at the end of the day for this is to find and sort of fix those system, typically on the public side, public infrastructure side defects. Um, some of the sort of post remediation quantification. So I'll just touch, there's a few different um, methods that you can use to sort of, once you've gone in, done your investigations and, and find and fixed and found and fixed uh, certain defects, there's ways you can monitor or utilize flow monitoring uh, to understand what reductions were achieved. So this is a flow monitoring, so you can kind of do your pre 
your projection pre and post. So if you capture enough flow data before and after those reductions, after that remediation, you can use that to understand how much flow is reduced in the system. Um, and then there's a few other um, uh, techniques that can be used. I won't touch on them too much today, but depending on the level of uh, you know what scale you want to go into and how much time and effort you want to take to get this accurately done, you can use various um, various techniques. Uh, each has their sort of advantages and disadvantages. There's a, a number here. I won't go through all of them, but um, depending on you know a lot of municipalities want to understand what reductions were achieved and come up with some sort of quantification of that reduction, um, then there's, again, various techniques that can be used and happy to chat with anybody about how to do that or, or what works best for, for your particular situation. Uh, so again, so this is a, the, the INI programs that we work on uh, today, focus mostly kind of on the flow monitoring and, and assisting with the INI reduction side of things. Next one, we'll get into sort of the modeling and, and talking about utilizing flow data for, for hydraulic modeling. Um, and then our last poll before I quickly wrap up. Um, just wondering if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one session with us, happy to get into some of the details a bit more. I know today uh, we only have an hour, so it's hard to get into all the nitty nitty gritty of all the things that can be done and have been done um, to analyze flow and to utilize that for INI studies. Just give that another couple seconds. Um, so yeah, just uh, I'll leave that poll up and, and feel free to enter your, your answers as we go. Uh, just a reminder that the last part five of five is coming up. Um, so, you know, if you don't follow us on LinkedIn, please do. Um, you'll see notifications on there for the next part in terms of schedule and, and getting the Zoom link and all that stuff. Uh, keep an eye out for our newsletters. We do send out our newsletter um, at least a couple weeks, usually before the webinars. So keep an eye out for that, and uh, hopefully you can register uh, for the next one, the the, the final part of of uh, the flow monitoring webinar series. So with that, I'll say thank you very much.